Okay. So hallelujah. Uh, we already sort of started fellowship, but right, in, in, in prayer, uh, we read Psalm 145, but um, this is just going to be recorded in the event that uh, it's shared with people who weren't able to join today. Uh, today is, uh, I think, on the Gregorian calendar, 13th of July, uh, 2024. And today is uh, a day of Saturday. We call Shabbat, Sabbath. So um, we're gathering together in, in honor of the commandments of our, our Father in Heaven and Son of Yeshua, Jesus Yeshua. Um, so I pray right now, Father, that you'll be exalted in this uh, gathering, uh, that your word will, will come through, that, that the hearts of the, the people watching, listening now, uh, they'll be edified. And if there's conviction, Father, to repent, then and thank you for your mercy upon all who hear the word and and turn to you. And so uh, I thank you for the information you shared with me and, and the brothers today and sisters today, uh, that it, it'll be shared in the order that you uh, would desire. And uh, please forgive us if we, if we step out of line anyway. Uh, but as your children, we yield this time to you. We love you so much. And we thank you and we bless you from where we are right here on this earth that you made as we wait the coming of our King, Messiah, Yusha, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, the topic was uh, about holiness, right? What does it mean to be holy and who is it for, right? I think there's some questions there. Um, this morning, I'll start in the New Testament because I think a lot of people who uh, claim to to know God and the Son, Yusha, Jesus, Jesus they, they sort of understand that they believe in the New Testament writing. So the question would be, are the New Testament writings exclusive, you know, to Christians, right? Like, that's all we need to follow is the New Testament. I think that's sort of a mentality that the church has perpetrated, that they they use the New Testament scriptures. And while a lot of them acknowledge that a lot of those scriptures that they're in the New Testament writings are from the Old Testament, they don't necessarily go back to read the Older Testament and say, oh, that's what that's that's what that really means. And so um, we live in a, in a very in interesting time where information overload internet you can get access to information with google and even these ai you know chat things or whatever um and they can be used to find truth but i think it can lead you to a place where you're just searching and searching and never really coming to the knowledge of truth which is the knowledge of god which is that he wants you to know him and his son so that you can be delivered on the day of redemption when he comes back to earth and judges the righteous and the unrighteous alike so we live in this time so when we read the New Testament scriptures, the question is, what does it really mean? So I'm going to start with First Peter, um, and I'll, I'll get to why uh, as we get through, I think, to ultimately to verse 16. Um, but understand that Peter is writing this epistle to a specific group, and he, he addressed that in his letter. It says, Peter, an emissary of Messiah Yahushua, to the sojourners in the diaspora, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, set apart, holy, made holy by the Spirit for obedience and for sprinkling with the blood of the Messiah, who should make grace and peace be multiplied unto you. So we know he's he's writing this to a group that is outside of the land, that the the gospel of the good news that the Messiah has come, and for those people who have been apart from Yah, they they come to this place of oh we know we're sinners and we need reconciliation. And so he's writing this to the specific group of people that God foreknew that would come to know him through his son. And it's the spirit that's doing this work, he, he says, and it's for being set apart for holiness. We'll get there. So then he says this, blessed be the God and father of our Lord, Yeshua the Messiah. In his great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of the Messiah, Yeshua from the dead. An incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading inheritance has been reserved in heaven for you. Man, what a blessing this is to read. Like, this is incredible. It says, by faith, you are being protected by God's power for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this greatly, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. It says, these trials, it says, these trials are so that the true metal of your faith Far more valuable than gold, which perishes through, though refined by fire, may come to light and praise and glory and honor the revelation of you who should Messiah. I can spend time and time on this piece of it, but these words should, should really cause you to understand that there's this order that God's given us, like once we come to know him, 
is sanctification. There's a salvation that's coming. So I've been saved, right? Born again. For what? To be holy, as you'll see. And trials are coming to you. You know, you should said the narrow path is not, it's it's the gate you got to go through, but it's a hard road. So it's there's going to be trials, there's going to be temptations, but he gives us the power to overcome. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. True enough, all of us can say this, right? And even though you don't see him now, you trust him and are filled with joy that is glorious beyond words, receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls, the prophets, you make reference to the prophets, so we have to listen to what the prophets said, right? Who spoke about that grace, the grace that was to be yours, searched for this salvation, investigated it carefully. They are trying to find out the time and circumstances of the Spirit of Messiah within them was indicating when predicting the sufferings in store for the Messiah and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were providing these messages not to themselves, but to you. These messages have been announced to you through those who proclaim the good news, the gospel, to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And even the angels long to look into these things. Uh, I always pause there because we have something, we have an understanding and knowledge of God that the angels looked into. The revelation of the Messiah, like 2,000 years later, we're still here like exalting his name and knowing that he provided these things. So here's what he says. This is this is where we're going. Verse 13, 1 Peter 1. So brace your minds for action. Your loins, right? Keep your balance and set your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. Like obedient children, do not be shaped by the cravings that you formerly had in your ignorance. Right? These are these you'll see that these connect with all the New Testament scriptures, especially it says you're a new creation, right? You've been born again. Like your heart is a new heart. Like he took that stony heart and he put it in a heart of flesh so that that heart of flesh could receive that mercy, the, hum the humility, that's the grace, the spirit that would cause you to walk in his ways, to be obedient children, not disobedient children. But says those other ways that you did. Now, instead, you are to be holy. It says, just like the Holy One who's called you to be holy yourselves, also in everything you do, it is written. You are to be holy, for I am holy. Okay. So holiness is a pursuit. Okay. It is not, we can be, we're being made holy. And holy, people think of the word holy as like, um, oh, this person's holy. Like you hear angels singing in, a, in music. No, holiness has um, meaning. It's be set apart. Be set apart from what? From your old ways, from the world ways of the world. And it's so that you could be made holy. It's a it's a process. And Hebrews 12, 14 says to pursue peace with all men and holiness for which without no one will see the Lord. They won't see him. Brother Luke, go ahead. It's a good transition point. Uh, thank you. So, um, yeah, I noticed he said that it links in with the other you know, New Testament scriptures and Romans 12. See, Paul says, says a similar thing, where he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Yahuwah, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, so as he said, apart, and acceptable unto Yah, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. So that we know, like he said, this holy is to be set apart, it's being set apart from the world, because we're not meant to be like the world, in it, but not of it. Um, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, um, the will of Yah. So, yeah. Amen. Yeah, Romans 12, just thanks for reading that, because that's a huge chapter that I think everyone should be reading. You should be reading the Bible all the time. But I believe that in the time that you're to learn things, like you will read scripture. I've read that chapter over and over again, because Yah made me read it over and over again. And I was like, each time I'm like getting more information or new information. So it's it's powerful, because then once you believe it, right, these are the things that you put in your mind. Your heart is actually then receiving it. Your heart is the, the seat of your emotions and the place where you make decisions. So if you make decisions that are based on what you're learning and reading, and now it's in your heart, then you'll do those things, which is why, you know, Peter was even saying, um, in everything you do, 
faith, what you do, not what you say you believe. Your heart has to be close to him. It says, the word is written, you are to be holy for I am holy. Now, what is this What is this reference to? There's three places or so in the scriptures. I believe it's in Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14, and uh, Leviticus 19. Okay. So this is where we're going we're, we're gonna to drive right. And I'm, I'm not going to go to Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 yet because a lot of people in the Messianic um, movements and things, they'll, they'll go there and say, see, God wants us not to eat pork, which is what it says in, in um, Leviticus 11, Deuteronomy 14. I'm like, yeah, but how many of you guys know people who don't eat pork or shellfish or whatever, but they're, they're unholy. <laughs> like they're not, they're not, un they're not holy. Right. It's like, it's a boastful, you know, boasting about what you don't eat or what you eat is, you know, is it still true? Yes. But it's like, that's not what sanctifies us. What sanctifies us is the word of God. Because Yahushua says in John 17, set them apart, make them holy by what? Your word, your word is truth. So all of his word is important. But holiness, what does it mean according to Yah's law, his Torah, his instructions? Leviticus 19. And I'll get in um, debate sometimes with, with people who are Christians, and they'll say um, things like Leviticus isn't for us or whatnot, or they'll say, do you like they'll be antagonists almost to the faith. They'll say, Do you put your wife outside the house when her menstrual cycle is happening? And and a lot of times they'll say, Yeah, I do. It's just to mess with them, but no, I don't make her leave the house. Because that's not really what the application of that was. It's to be separated, like not to um have intercourse with your wife during her menstrual. You're not supposed to touch the blood. Like there's a reasons for that. Okay. Makes you unclean. And and so if if we think that um the food laws are done away with because of something that's been twisted in Mark chapter seven. And, um, you know, I'm like, well, one of the things that I'll ask the Christian is, well, let's turn this around instead of you, you know, putting me under a microscope. Let me ask you a question. Um, do you think it's okay to, to have intercourse with a family member or a, a horse or an animal or whatever? No, 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 I would never do that. Okay. Then that, where do you have that? Where, where is that from that you wouldn't do that? Well, what do you mean? It's just, you know, I'm like, no, because it's not in the New Testament. It doesn't say in the New Testament and out of Christ's mouth that bestiality is a, an abomination, right? But what, where does it say that? It says it in Leviticus. Leviticus 18 and 20, which gives us the rules for what, what Yah says sexual immorality is, right? So all the time we see sexual immorality in the New Testament scriptures, abstain from sexual immorality. Um, wh why, why, how can they define that without the Torah? Just a just a thought, if you're ever being questioned, you know, about, oh, you think you're following Moses' law. Well, let's let's talk about it. But if people aren't willing to engage, then don't chase after. Like, like you you stand on the truth, and that's what's going to confront people. And if they don't want to hear it, it's not on you. But if they do want to hear it, then, you know, invite them to have discourse and discussion, but it should be in a healthy way. Um, but let's go to Leviticus 19, now that I've given you the segue. It's on and, Okay, so it says this, Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation of the children of Israel and tell them you are to be set apart or holy for I, Yahuwah, your God, am holy. That's 1 Peter 1.16, it's right there, right? So now it defines what this, mean, what this means. Okay, verse three, Leviticus 19, each one of you is to respect his mother and his father, honor your mother and father. And keep my Sabbaths. I am you who are your God. Okay, so he's now shown two of the Ten Commandments, right? Holiness, set apart. Okay. Verse 4. Do not turn to idols or make a molten God of image for yourselves. I am you who are your God. So he's making that question and he says who he is because his authority is his word. It is written. That's why the Messiah, usually when he was tested by Satan, who knew scripture, he said, it is written, and he quoted the Torah, quoted it three times. So we know that our Messiah knows that the word of God is, is written, is still applicable. So why would we not think so? Because we're in the world, and the, the world and the devils and a lot of churches. And I realized this morning, it's like you have a father no matter what. Either it's Yah, Yah, or it's the devil. Even Messiah was like, you, you, you people think Abraham's your father. Your father's the devil. Because you... You think you're holy, but you're not following this. And we'll continue because, again, there's going to be people who say, we keep the Sabbath, right? 
and we don't have idols. We don't have statues of Mary, whatnot, but they're not following the whole instruction in Leviticus 19. It says, when you bring a sacrifice of fellowship offerings to Yahuwah, you are to offer it so that you may be accepted. Again, another reference to the beginning of the book, Cain, Abel, what made it an acceptable sacrifice? They both made offerings. He says what, what the problem is here. You'll see. He said, it is to be eaten on the same day you offer it and the next day. But if anything remains until the third day, it is to be burned with fire. This is sort of interesting. It's kind of funny to me. Sorry, I'm throwing this in there as a commentary. But like, I won't eat leftovers more than two days old. And I was like, see, honey, I, I won't eat the, the leftovers. She's like, why don't you eat leftovers? I'm like, because it's the third day. I won't eat leftovers the third day. Sort of a joke. But see, you can make scripture mean something <laughs> you want to me but anyway i digress okay but it says um is to be eaten on the third day if it is eaten on the third day it's disgusting it will not be accepted rather anyone who eats it will bear his iniquity since he has profaned what is holy to yahuwah and his soul will be cut off from his people so people will say doesn't matter what we eat doesn't matter what we eat um i believe so i won't go too far off the path here but we'll talk about second corinthians 6 14, and people stop at the end of 2 Corinthians 6, boom. Well, you don't realize the chapter and verse is added. If you were to go into chapter 7, verse 1, he continues saying what he was saying at the end of 2 Corinthians 6. And he's like, yeah, your phys physical holiness matters. Taking care of your, your temple. So it is still applicable. So, again, you can subvert the scriptures and make them say what you want if you cut off the end of it or even the beginning and take it out of context. Um, now, in verse 9 of Leviticus 19, back to Leviticus 19, he's talking about, now he's going to talk about um, the very things that in the New Testament speaks, speaks of it too, but this is part of your heart, okay? When you reap your harvest in your land, okay? now most of us don't have um, jobs, if you will, where it's agricultural, but they did then, and some do still, but mostly the, the things that you're going to read about agriculturally because we're so far removed from it, you won't necessarily understand it, but the principle is still here. When you reap the harvest in your land, you are not to reap to every to the very corner of your field, nor are you to gather gleanings, um, to gather the gleanings of your harvest. You're not to pick the remnants of your vineyard, vineyard nor are you to gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. Instead, you're to leave them for the poor, for the outsider. I am you who are your God. Okay. Taking care and and being generous towards other people. Because you've harvested, but there's going to be things like, he said, like your grapes, and there's going to be things that have, have gone to the corners. Don't do not do that. And you know what is great about that principle, too, is that you won't know it. But by by obeying Yah, you, um, you leave things for other people to receive, and they're blessed by the Father, blessed by God. They'll praise Him. But if you're out there going, hey, look what I gave to the poor. Look at these ministries I started, and look at these people, what they're eating, and look. You're getting glory from men for yourself. And I'm always careful with that. Don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing, is what the Messiah said. Right? Give. But if you people know about it, you've received your reward here, right? Not in glory, where that's where we're supposed to receive our reward. But the principle is to be generous and don't worry, right? Like, oh, my harvest is here. Praise Yah. Well, now I'm going to hoard it for myself and store it up. Messiah has a parable about that, too. Um, verse 11, you are not to steal, you are not to lie, you are not to deceive one another. Don't steal and don't lie. Where is that from? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are all about holiness. They're about holiness. Verse 12, you are not to swear by my name falsely. How many people do that? And, and yeah, forgive us if we've done that. Right? You are not to profane the name of your God. I am Yahuwah. Like, don't profane his name. And those people would say, you can't say his name. And I'm like, well, I'm not saying you have to say it the way I say it. I'm not saying that the, the vowel pointings and stuff in the Masoretic are, are wrong. Like, people can say whatever they want. But um, I read, I heard this earlier. It was, um, I'm not going to make this about the name, but I just want you to understand. Um, uh, people will say, well, how come... Abraham doesn't have to be translated, right? It doesn't have to be like Abraham, Abraham. It's still Abraham, right? Um, David, 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 David. You know, it's like 
they didn't change it into a Greek name. So why is it important that, you know, we say, oh, the name's not Jesus? Well, it's Jesus in the Greek. Where was that derived from? You have to look into these things. Because if it if we really were to take what the Messiah's name was, if we took it from the Hebrew, the, it would be closer to Joshua if it was in an English word. So we'd say Joshua, right? We wouldn't say Jesus. Like, it's sort of a weird thing, but I, I'm not going to be the name police and go out there and tell people you can't use that name because, you know, I said the name. God was merciful to me and revealed himself to me through that sacrifice. So God's going to use what he uses and how he chooses to use it. But now that I know it, it's like, do I continue to just use it or fight for that name? No, even Yeshua, right? It means salvation. I call him Yeshua because some people go, well, that's how I call him Yeshua. It means salvation. Yeah, it does mean salvation. And our God is the God of salvation. Um, but when I started to learn more about, well, what is the name of the Father that was removed 7,000 times from the, the, the scriptures? That's a problem. They put Lord, the Lord in there, or they put Adonai in there, or they put in Hashem, you know, maybe well-meaning. I, I don't know, but I do know that his name is to be exalted amongst the earth. Well, how can we exalt his name or speak his name if we just have to say the Lord? Or because there's going to be people who say Lord, Lord, right? Um, the name Baal means Lord. Like, we have to know who he is. That's why at the end of these scriptures, he says, I am Yahuwah. I am Yah. I am Yah, like he's saying his name is the authority, right, of who we are, a set of our people for, for his glory. Luke, please go ahead and share, brother. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, so basically, I just wanted to share that, um, just touching on the name, what I found interesting, because you mentioned Matthew 7 and a lot of people, because he does say, it says, that um, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And we see a lot of people, not saying that, you know, they're going to be condemned because they're using the name of Jesus, but we see a lot of them not in obedience. So I do believe, like, you know, the name matters. But it says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Now, that's a question, as we see it in our, in our scriptures. And it's like, well, if we don't have the name and, you know, Yahuwah says throughout the Tanakh and the Torah, call upon my name, so his name must be important. It's like, well, and then the next verse, Messiah says, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It's hard It's hard to know someone properly, I would say, without knowing their, their actual name. Because it's like, I, I would say it's like, my name's Luke. You know, wherever I go, I'm going to tell people my name's Luke. You know, if they get it a bit wrong, I'm just going to be like, even understanding, you know, from different countries, sometimes people pronounce things different, but it's like, my name's Luke, and you try and elaborate on to me. So it's like, I do believe there's significance in the name, in, in the name of Yahuwah. I agree. And um, it, it definitely holds power as well, because it's, it's his true name. So it's like, like his, there's power in his name. You know? We know that yeah. his name is holy, and his name is a, a representation of him. That's why we're not meant to take it in vain. Right? Yeah. And I think that's, you know, it, people can be prideful in that. And I think even with somebody in the chat, it's like, uh, uh, People are saying, if you say the name Jesus, you're going to hell. I don't believe that. I don't believe if you say that name, there's people who say it because that's the name they've been trained with. And all over the world, you know, Jesus Christos or however they say it in, in other countries. Um, the problem isn't the phonetic speaking of the name. The problem is you're worshiping a different Christ, a different Messiah, a different God. is, And so that becomes the issue. Now, Yahushua, Yeshua, Jesus he says, I've come in my father's name in John 5, 43. And you won't receive me, but another will come in his own name and you will receive him. So that was like a prophetic warning about the future. Like people are not going to receive him. And, you know, that's just, you know, that's crazy. So even in um, Exodus, right? Chapter 34, we said it in the Psalm and Psalm 145, right? And Psalm 45 was of David. He didn't make anything up, right? So you go back and you say, when... When Moses, Moshe, Moses, see, Moses wasn't translated to something weird, but he says, um, show me your glory in verse chapter 34 of Exodus, verse six, it says, then Yahuwah passed by him and proclaimed, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, it says, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abundant in grace and truth, showing mercy to the thousand generation, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means leaving the guilty unpunished and bringing iniquity of the fathers upon the children upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So yeah, yeah, yeah proclaims his name, 
I don't think he was like, if you say this name exactly right, he's saying, this is my name. This is my renown, my reputation. You know, that's why when we proclaim his name, it's it's from here. It's like, you you wash me, you cleanse me, you're compassionate, you're kind, you're loving, you're merciful, you know? And then, you know, the, the part is we're supposed to have that same heart because the Messiah and his father were one. He had the same heart. Did he lay down his life? Yes, that's the greatest love, right? But also, um, did he rebuke the religious leaders harshly? Yes. Why? He was mean? No, he's he's loving. He's rewarding them. And the, the epistles you'll see, as we've been, been reading, they're not easy to read sometimes. We skip over a lot of those verses because it doesn't sound nice, but it is love. You know, it's part of love. And we're going to read that in a second, too, back to Leviticus 19. Um. So he says, um, you are not to swear by my name falsely, nor profane the name of your God. I am you who is sorry for this side chat. But I think that we're supposed to um, we're supposed to uh, share that. Um, I haven't been reading the chat, but um, yeah, you guys are already in there. So that's fine. I'm not going to, I can't really monitor the chat. I'm trying to keep an eye on if people join or not, because then I have to let them in. Okay, so now. Uh, verse 14, you are not to curse the deaf nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear Yahu your, your Elohim. I am Yahuwah. Okay, so blind and deaf, right? Is that physical? Yes, but also metaphorically spiritual, right? There's a lot of people who have no ears to hear, and they're blind, either through pride, right? Look at John 9. He said, you're, you're blind. You can't see. Even though you can see, you can't see. So we don't want to put a stumbling block in front of them. Um, we want them to, to hear and see, too. Um, okay, now verse 15, this is where it gets really interesting, right? Already interesting. You are not to do injustice in judgment. So brothers and sisters, are we supposed to judge? Matthew 7 says, don't judge lest you be judged. But if you keep going, it says, the speck in your brother's eye, don't take it out if you got a big plank in yours. So take that big plank out of yours or the big, you know, log in your eye then you can take the speck out of your brother's eye. So yes, it, as long as you're doing it in just judgment, you're supposed to, to do this with your family, okay? It says you are not to be partial to the, the poor, no show favoritism toward the great, but you are to judge your neighbor in fairness. So Leviticus 19, you're saying Christ spoke against us. No, he didn't. In fact, in John 7, 16, was it? He says, Ju judge with righteous judgment, not self-righteous judgment. Because the problem is your brother or sister is not going to hear you if you're in sin and you're telling them not to sin. They're going to be like, you're a hypocrite. And you are. Right. That's why he says you're a hypocrite if you if you don't take the log out of your eye. So um, but then there's people who will say, oh, you're judging me. You're a hypocrite. Maybe when you're not because they're defending their right to stay in sin. Love covers a multitude of sins. And that's about turning somebody who's left the path back to the righteous path. Right. John uh, James 5, 19 and 20 says that. And that's a repeat from the Torah as well. OK, um, so not showing favoritism is important, too, because let's say someone's got a lot of money or they're in a high position. Right. You can't judge them because, well, they're they're wealthy. No, like the wealthy people are, are going to. That's the hardest ones to get, because it says that. Um, you should you should says like. It's hard for a rich person to get into the kingdom because they end up making gold or silver, the things that the treasure of their heart, you know, their hope and their 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 riches, as opposed to their hope in Yahuwah. And then what they do is they they store up wealth for themselves and it's going to rust and die and burn. Right. So that's why I say give to the poor, give to people. Uh, you'll be a channel for, for blessing. Can you be wealthy? Sure. You can be wealthy, but you can't hold on to it. Yeah, let it go. Right. So. Um, and then people who are poor, you know, you should went to the people who were the poorest. Why? Because they were the most destitute, the most broken. So it's a good thing to be poor in this world and rich in heaven, right? It's a good thing. So he said, he's showing you don't show that, 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 um, and we'll, you will probably speak in James two as well. Um, because it says that again, but go ahead, Luke. I was going to say, um, yeah, it's interesting. So it does say, you see in Psalm 51, it says that the sacrifices of Yah is that, um, but I don't want to misquote, so I'll quickly go to the verse. It says, the sacrifices of Yah are a broken spirit, a broken contract heart. 
oh, you who are that were not the spies. And we see the same in Matthew 5, it links in with, you know, you who, like you said, you know, they were the most broken people. So, yeah. 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 The persecuted, bro, going to go to the prisons, right? You know, there's a lot of people who are rich who are in prison. You know, prison to the cares of this world, right? So we all have trials, things overcome, because if if we don't have them, there's no glory given to Yah for breaking you free from the things that would bind you to the, the things that will keep your soul from entering into glory. It's a soul thing, not a flesh thing, right? Flesh and spirit, they're they're like this, right? So let us let us continue because I think we're gonna get to this part where I think it will start to connect to what the Messiah said and what other uh, apostles said. All right, so verse uh, 16, okay. Now you are not to go up and down as a tail bearer among your people. Okay, a gossiper, someone who sows discord amongst your people. It's abomination, right? According to Proverbs 6, 19. It says, um, you are not to endanger the life of your neighbor. I am Yahuwah. So again, there's people who will keep the Ten Commandments, but what do they do? They slander you behind your back. They talk about you. They backbite. Like, this is a warning. Don't do that. And it's part of what we're going to get to in verse 18. All of this is. Um, but it says in verse 17, you are not to hate your brother in your heart. Maybe one of the most significant things to say, maybe today, because I think a lot of people who are being set apart for holiness are being tested in the wilderness that they're in. And there's family, there's friends, there's people who have been nasty to you. And what he's saying is you can't hate them in your heart. Okay. Turn the other cheek. Don't hate you. Don't hate them. But here's what he says. If it's a brother, right? Some people are not brothers. You know, some people in your own family are not brothers of Messiah yet. They can be maybe. But they're not yet. But instead, you are to firmly rebuke your neighbor. There it is again. Firmly. And not to bear sin because of him. You are not to take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. So judgment, judging the brother in sin, partially, is not a judgment against them from a vengeance perspective. That's Yah's, Yah's vengeance, right? It says, do not take vengeance upon nor bear any grudge against the children of your people but but love your neighbor as yourself i am yahuwah what where have we heard love your neighbor as yourself right from our messiah's mouth right from paul's mouth right right from um the apostles i think john speaks of this as well but if you can take leviticus 19 1 through 18 as this is what it means to love your neighbor as yourself it's a good th it's a good perspective to have okay james talks about it too and um let's let's read i'm going to read i think uh luke you brought this up so do you want to read matthew 22 34 through 40 i think that was one you brought this morning so matthew 22 oh, let me put my hand down what it is what's that uh, i put my hand down because i had it real oh gotcha it's still for a while matthew 22 34 to 40. So it says, but when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Yahushua said unto him, Thou shalt love the, uh, Yahuwah thy Elohim with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So they're supported by those two commandments because they summarize the whole law and we know that loving yah and loving our neighbor is how we fulfill the law so we have to do the things in the law to do that that's that's how i've interpreted it from coming to the knowledge of torah because it's like you know love is what yah called us to be in and that's obedience to every instruction he has and it brings peace like overall it brings peace it's a life of peace a life of shalom so yeah so, yeah. yeah please yeah so right out of the Messiah's mouth, he says the greatest commandment, which means he wasn't doing away with the commandments. And a lot of people in the uh, Torah movements, Messianic movements, if you will, they'll say, see, you know, Yeshua said, uh, Matthew 5, 17, I've not come to abolish the Torah of the prophets, not to abolish, but to fulfill. Because a lot of people in, that we face within Christianity who don't understand what the 
the words mean there or they they do what their pastor says which is um the law is done away with sort of mentality it's like he said it's not done away with twice like he made sure he emphasized it's not done away with he says not all will um not one jot or tittle or yod or stroke however they say it will be um changed until all is fulfilled okay and and so you'll get into battles with people but listen i didn't receive you know this conviction on my own maybe through brothers that rebuked me right and you know Jan knows his own and he knows who he's going to use to um you know rebuke you in in your situation so if you have a humble heart you know it's good to take it to prayer and and read the scriptures and let him speak to you and let him show you these truths because if he says you know you're this is a truth don't reject it because somebody told you to but also don't make it something that takes you into another area of doctrine that's not really of him because then you're actually going against what he said it's it's a it's a fine line that's why he call it, calls it the narrow path and you know when when the messiah said don't go to the right to the left stay on the on the narrow path you know that's exactly what deuteronomy 4 says don't deviate to the right or to the left that's what joshua 1 says don't go to the right or the left follow this this torah right follow the law and it's spiritual it is spiritual i know people want to make it into um letters right or to like like oh we have to keep a um i'm very careful about that because there's people who do certain things on shabbat or don't do it on shabbat like that sort of thing and that's between them and yeah i i can't make their conviction be mine and i can't my, make my conviction be yours and so we have to be careful about judging somebody who's pursuing righteousness because they might be showing you something that you're rejecting because your flesh doesn't want to but also they might be don't change what your conviction is because somebody doesn't agree with you you know you need to stay focused on him and doing his will and righteousness which is obeying his law like what did he write in your heart what did he write when he gave you a new heart he says i write my laws on their heart what laws are that well whichever one he says he says i'm you like all the laws being on the so um, I share this because even the food laws thing was the first thing that I was like, oh, yeah, let me I can give up eating pork because I read it that someone shared with me. And I was like, yeah, when did when did pork become clean? Not because Christ died on Christ. Like that seems sort of absurd to me that when Jesus died, all of a sudden animals that we weren't allowed to eat will now become a clean animal. It just never sat well with me. But I didn't realize that. Like fundamentally, I'm like, well, that's probably a good thing to not do. Well, let me let me not do it anymore. So my faith was enacted, meaning I read it, I received it, spirit convicted me. It wasn't like a harsh conviction. It was like, well, what else would you not do for me? Is what yeah, I was saying. Like, can you give up eating your ham? I'm like, sure, I did it. And immediately the next day, I was at a um a golf event when I used to be able to play golf. And we were getting the buffet line eating food, and there was a bacon one, and I went, Oh, I skipped it. And he's like, you don't want bacon? And I was like, yeah, I don't eat it anymore. Since when? I'm like, well, like since yesterday. And he was like, well, why? I was like, well, I'm on a Levitical diet now, you know, because like those fun, funny diets, they go, I'm on the South Beach diet or whatever. I'm on a Levitical diet. And he goes, what's that? I said, well, in the book of Leviticus, it says these things are for you to eat, not eat. And he's like, whatever, man. Like this was a Hindu. So it wasn't like I was like talking to a Christian, right? But it's so it's weird because then he started talking about me to people going, yeah, this Nick doesn't eat pork anymore. He thinks he's Jewish. And I was like, I don't think I'm Jewish. Like, but like, isn't our God the God of the Jews sort of thing? Like that that time, I was just like, isn't it like? So why are we, you know, why are we doing things or saying things that um, he said as if he didn't say it? Like that's not wise. So you can bear witness to people about through you're not eating pork, but it shouldn't be. I'm um, just don't eat pork. You know, it should be like what. Well, I've been born again. You know, God gave me a new heart. He showed me things in the in his scriptures that I realize are for my good. And when you obey them, it's a blessing. When you disobey them, it's not good, right? And so people want to make it, you know, say, is it a salvation issue? I'm like, what's not a salvation issue? You know, like, hear his voice, do what he said. And when people make um, statements like, is this a salvation issue? I'm like, well, why would you ask that question? Like, are you, are you worried? Like, do you want to stay in some sort of sin and still yourself. be saved? You know, it's almost um think so. So anyway, yeah, brother, go ahead. I always I noticed that one time I see in a, a quote, it wasn't like you know it's from scripture, but it was a quote of someone 
that they said the mindset of believers now is like back in the day they wanted to know what they could do to be so what they had to do they wanted to follow but now people want to know how much they can hold on to and still be saved you know they want to hold on to as much of their ways and we see in Isaiah 55 that he says his ways are above our ways so whatever it comes to I see it as this it's whatever it comes to or whatever we see and he reveals anything to us instruction wise we should submit to that because at the end of the day the submission is what we need to do is it's Messiah's example he was in full submission to his will and his ways are above ours so I mean we're going to see certain things that we we might have hold to but we have to give them up for the most high because at the end of the day it's only temporary anyway you know and we have to love you with all of our heart me I'll put it in the chat that's right we have to, we have to love you with all of our heart so mm -hmm. yeah yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's the greatest commandment, all of our hearts. So it it is a, it's a heart issue. You know, as much as someone says you think you're earning salvation because you um you don't eat pork, I'm like, no, it's basic. Like it's not a earning salvation thing. I don't earn it. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions. So like even as I've grown in my faith 24 years later and probably 12 with the understanding that we're supposed to keep God's commandments even though it's right there in the, in the text, in the new Testament, um, we still fall short, but the thing is like, how, how short are you falling? Like, are you denying him openly? Like that's sort of a blatant, like people have left the way they do. They end up denying him like even openly. Um, my concern isn't, you know, my concern is for the people that are called by his name, who believe in him, that they'll hear well done, good faithful servant, that they've done the will of Yah, because it says that's who's going to enter into the kingdom. Not, not a church that says we continue to do all these things, right? Even though he says not to, because he says lawlessness is the very thing that will keep people out of the kingdom. And I'm like, that's a fearful statement. Like that woke me up hard. I was like, oh man, like, and then I think that's the heart of, of Yah's children is, is that me? Like, that's not about me. Is that really about me? Like, even when Messiah said to his disciples at the, at the, the Passover, he said, one of you is going to betray me. What was the uh, question of most of them? I think they were like, is it, is it me? Like they were worried it might've been them. And that's the heart of a disciple. It's not, oh, it's not me. I would like, they, like Peter did. He's like, I would never deny you. He's like, you're going to do it three times. But look at Peter's, look at Peter's conviction. Look at his restoration. Judah, Judas, Judah, Yehuda, whatever, Judas, however you call him. It, he was destined for that position. Like someone had to betray the Messiah. It's crazy, right? Like I just don't want to be that guy. Like I don't want you guys to think that you would be that person either. But um, but thanks for saying that. Luke, there's a couple of things I want to share. And it almost probably feels like rapid fire a little bit, but I think these are really good things to sort of uh, tie all these things together. This is how I feel about Bible studies and gatherings is, it's like, okay, that's your perspective, but what other evidence do you have? And when you see two or three different examples or witnesses, then you're like, oh, okay, maybe I can embrace that connection, but it's going to be the spirit that shows us. So look at what James chapter, I'll go to James. I say James, you guys know it's Yaakov, Yaakov, Jacob, because <laughs> there was no James, right? The, the book of James, anytime the, the, uh, the disciple James, like this was King James' idea to have his name in the Bible. So. Let's move on. But they're Hebrews. Okay. These weren't, um, they weren't Englishmen. Put it that way. All right. All right. So look at James chapter one. You can read all, all of it, but go to the last two verses because these are the ones that sort of catch my attention or caught my attention back in the day. Verse 26 says, If anyone thinks he's religious yet does not bridle his tongue, but is deceived in his heart, this person's religion, the worship of, of, of God, is futile. Okay. So watching what we say, right? Don't be a talebearer among your people, right? There's, you know, don't be a slanderer. Don't be a gossiper, right? So then it says, the pure and undefiled religion before our God the, and Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being unstained by the world. People think, I fed the orphans and widows. Okay, good. That's good. That's good. You're supposed to take them in their distress. Because even Paul says some widows, you know, the younger ones in particular, they're, you don't just take care of them. Like they, that's what it says, right? I think in Timothy, one of the things about this deals with the widows, but to keep yourself from being stained by the world, that that's a call to holiness, right? To be set apart. 
That's the because I'm part. Now go to chapter two. Check this out. This is, I think this is so cool. My brothers and sisters, do not hold the faith of our glorious Lord Yusha, the Messiah, while showing favoritism. Right? Leviticus 19. Don't show deference to the poor, right? Or the, the great, you know, and look down on the poor. Don't show favoritism. For if a man with a gold ring and fine clothes comes into your gathering, your synagogue, and the poor person is filthy clothes and also comes in, and you pay special attention to the one wearing the fine clothing, and you say, sit here in this good place. And you say to the poor person, stand there or sit by the footstool. Haven't you made distinctions between yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And he's talking about synagogues. People are like, a synagogue, you know, one of the things that people say is like, oh, that's for the Jews, right? The to go to synagogue on Shabbat. Well, first of all, the synagogue is a Greek word that means gathering, the synagogue, right? Just like the church, people think the church is the Roman Catholic Church or the my church I go to on Sundays. It's not the church is us, guys. We're the we're the, the church. And we're the we're the body. Ecclesia is the Greek word, um, the assembly. We're the gathered, we're the people who are Yah's people. So our synagogue is our gathering. This is synagogue right now. It's not a building. I went to the synagogue. You could say you went to synagogue today. Isn't that cool? You could say I went to the synagogue. Um, go ahead, Luke. I was just going to add as well, people always forget. He did say where there's two or three gathered in my name, I'll be amongst them. And I realized that that's really, really important. That people don't realize that like, two or three gathered in his name at the end of the day, we're gathered to observe the scriptures together. So that's a good thing to look at as well and remember that. It doesn't have to be in a building or a church. Because you know? some people can't go to a church. Well, that's teaching truth. Man. Anyway. Yeah, and Luke and I gathered yesterday. It wasn't Sabbath. So we still gathered yesterday. What did we do? We lifted holy hands. Well, hopefully holy hands. And we prayed. And we sought God's will for his people. That we prayed for specific people who are really broken and gone far off the path. And we could either judge them and be like, oh my goodness, this guy is not sin. And Luke said, let's pray for him. I'm like, what a blessing. Like I, I was sitting there like this guy's messed up and, but you know, and there's going to be times like that. So don't under, don't underestimate the power of Yah when we pray. Right. Like I can go off in so many places, but just keep this in mind. Like the, the centurion who told you, when he told Jesus, Yeshua, he said, if you just say that my, guard will be made well I, I understand authority you can just speak it you don't have to come to see him or lay hands on him and Yahushua said what great faith is this I haven't seen this sort of faith in all of Yashorel or Israel right he said he's he's well and the soldier was healed did the soldier pray for healing maybe not but this man did and Yah heard it Yahushua heard it and he healed him like amazing right so don't that's that's in our Bible but so don't underestimate the power of prayer and when we come together in agreement and seek him wholeheartedly and, and, and plead with him for mercy upon people, he responds. And we might not even know it until some other time, but I trust, I believe that he answers the prayers of the faithful, the righteous, it says it right there too, in James 5 as well. And we see it all through the scriptures. All right, back to James 2. This is, this is, this is great. Listen, he says, Verse three or five. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Again, he's addressing these people as his brothers and sisters, right? Didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he's promised to those who love him? See, I was saying it, but not like as well as he said it. But he says, but you have dishonored the poor. Isn't the rich, isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Man, don't they blaspheme me, the good name by which you were called? And now listen to this. If, however, you fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show favoritism, you are committing sins and are convicted by the Torah as transgressors. Wait, he says, fulfill the royal law, loving your neighbor yourself. Didn't we just read Leviticus 19? So as he's saying, don't show favoritism, it's not just rebuking your neighbor and not showing a grudge, because that's what a lot of people in some of these crazy groups will say. Read the whole thing. Don't be a tailbearer among your people. Don't don't gossip about somebody. You know, go to them. Go to your brother and say, hey, that's not right. Mom and dad's gonna find out. But let's repent. You know, let's not let's not 
hurt each other. But he says, if you show favoritism, that's also in Leviticus 19. You know, loving your neighbors yourself isn't exclusive to rebuke, as I'm trying to say. <laughs> A lot of people think that. Um, and some people think loving your neighbors yourself is is just being nice to people, right? Like, oh, I love you. No, you got to you have to rebuke them, but in, in the right heart, in the way that Yah would choose you to do it. Um, now, this one that people use, listen to this one, because he says, but if you show favoritism, you're committing sin and are convicted by the, the law, the Torah, as a transgressor. So there's still a law and there's still transgression to the law. But he says, forever keeps the whole law and stumbles at one point, becomes guilty of all. That's one of the things that a lot of people in um, the churchianity, if you will, will say, oh, uh, see, if you broke one, you broke them all. So you're, you're a transgressor. Well, so you're saying we shouldn't obey the law of God because I broke one. But well, the point that Paul is making here is, look, you could be obeying nine commandments, right? Or like all these commandments, right? But if you break covetousness or you bear false witness, but you kept the Shabbat, you, you're guilty. Okay. You're guilty. Like you've transgressed. It's not giving an excuse that you don't have to obey any of the law. That's the translate. That's the uh, interpretation that they have. And that's just not true. Um, and even continues, he says, for the one who says, do not commit adultery, also says, do not commit murder. Now, if you commit adultery, but you do not commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. James, uh, I'm sorry, First John 3, 4. If you break the Torah, you are in sin. That's what sin is, is transgressing the law of God. So speak to those and act as those who will be judged according to the Torah that gives freedom. How can the law give freedom, guys? Because the law is not the law. It's the instructions. It's it's. Right? It's Yah's voice, his law, his light. It's the very thing how we hear his voice is, is his law. It says, those who turn their ear from hearing my Torah, Proverbs 29, their prayers will be an abomination. I don't want my prayers to be an abomination. So, okay, if I've transgressed the Torah, I've sinned, even though I know better now, then it says, if you confess your sins, John 1, 9, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful just to forgive you. Like, so, the conviction on our heart is the work of the spirit so that we'll repent and start obeying the Torah again. That gives freedom because there's freedom. When you obey God's ways, it's a blessing. And as parents, you guys would know, Max didn't find out real quick. As a parent, if your child obeys what you've instructed them because you love them, then they're going to be blessed. If they disobey it, not good, but your baby, like Luke will not understand this, your baby is, she doesn't know that she can do or not do certain things, but you're training her. It's a process. So our father is the same way. When we're born again, it says that because we're babies. So now that we're babies, we're his children. So what do his children do? They listen to their, their father's instructions. Do they always do that? No. Do we always do it? No. But as we mature, there's going to be a greater expectation. Now, when your baby gets a little bit older, and knows you're not supposed to touch the stove, like or whatever, you know, make something up. But, but like, when they do break it, you're not you want to destroy them. You're just like I've, I've told you, this is for your good. And now I'm going to put you in time out or give you a swat on the behind so that you don't do it again. It's not because I hate you, but Yah is going to do that. He's going to discipline his children because he loves us. Okay, he loves his children, and he loves when they fear him in reverence and they obey him. Go ahead, Luki. I just wanted to touch on how you said that, you know, we'll be made free. Because when you asked the question, I was thinking, oh, we're going to answer. But no, John 8, you know, when he said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We know that's his Torah, it's his light, his directions. As he said, you you pretty much said everything else I could say, but we know that the truth makes us free, which is just his Torah. So it's, it's his light, a light, of, a life of light. And Messiah said he's the light of the world. So and he's the word made flesh. So, we you know, follow him, follow the word the Torah, and we'll, we'll be made free. It's a path that leads to, you know, that when you look at Yahushua and you look at the Torah as being the same thing, right, wrapped in flesh, like that, that's like, okay, so why would we not desire to follow our shepherd? I'm the good shepherd, right? And law, law is a bad translation, actually. Um, I don't have a problem with the word law, but it just has a negative connotation, right? The, um, the word Torah is a the Hebrew word, Torah. It just means instruction and it's teachings, actually. In many places, it's called teaching. 
And so the word Torah has the word or in it, and the word or within that, the word or, O-R-E, in the Hebrew is light. It's a, it's it's just a, a beautiful way that Yah shows, like, he created light. You should have the light of the world. Well, if you should the Torah, and it was made flesh. Like, we're, we're free. We're set free by the, the Torah. The, and you'll be like, well, no, you're not. You're set free by Yusha. Yeah, but Yusha is the Torah. He took out flesh. Now, the Torah itself is a is a a mirror for us to look to distinguish if we're if we're right or wrong. And if you look at yourself in the Torah, which brings freedom, and you see, oh, I've got some stuff on my face, I better clean it up. Like Yusha's um, sacrifice, like there had to be a blood sacrifice, like the atonement. This is a hard teaching for people to understand, and it was back then. But like, how can you know? this man called himself bread you know and food right and we're supposed to eat him like who can understand this teaching somehow some way it makes it possible as a spiritual condition of our heart that we're like well we're surrendered we'll do anything he says we love him so much that that if he says you know what son i don't want you to eat that ham anymore i'd be like yes yes let's yes father yes lord i won't do that and he's like wow look at my kid he listens to me not oh yay he doesn't eat pork like that's just a basic thing right and so, um, in the last verse of this, I'll read in James 2. For judgment is, is merciless to the one who does not show mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy, you guys. So if our rebuke for a brother isn't to be for Yah's mercy, then, like, that's not right. Your heart's not right. It's about restoration. And you will be mocked and hated. Why? Because Messiah said, if you pursue righteousness, you'll be mocked and ridiculed for it but that's to get you off of the path right that's to get people to to get you back into to sin so that they're happy about you right they're happy about what you're doing because like oh good now i don't have to be convicted by what luke's doing because he's back back in sin right go ahead bro i was gonna add on to when you said that you know it's just the things that we're meant to be doing is it um luke 17 which is is interesting it says in 9 and 10 does he thank the, that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. And we see the same in Ecclesiastes. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes um, 13 and 14, it says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear Yahuwah and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For you who shall bring every work into judgment whether, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So it's just what's expected of us, you know. That's how I see it. It's like, like you said, no no dad wants their child to disobey. So, But it's like when they do obey, it's not like, it's like it's, you're doing what you're meant to do. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly because you want things to go well for your children because you want them to live a, a blessed life. Um, and then the the test is going to be that they go after riches or they go after and they, or they end up in sexual morality and they're just like that's a bondage right and um yah's gonna like that's why we have to pray for your kids and because yah's gonna redeem uh, and mercy upon people that maybe weren't praying for it but when they go through difficult things you're like this is what we prayed for because it's better for you to to die right and even uh have a horrible life but die and and have eternal life then you have a great life and, and go to hell right that's just you know eternity is a big deal because it's eternal life with the father and the kingdom and with his his set apart ones and saints which i don't feel worthy of i don't think anybody on here I, I know would be like oh yeah i'm i'm ready for kingdom life it's like no nah, we're we're being set apart now and sanctified for that time but our righteousness by practicing it I think we'll be prepared for that eternal glory. And that's why our prayers, our worship, that's why I was telling you earlier, my prayer this morning wasn't, God, can you please? It's like, God, Father, you're holy. You're righteous. You're the king of kings. You're the Lord. You are on the most high. You're forgiving, you know, merciful. You're, you know, patient. You're loving. You're all, you know, all these things because that's who he declares himself to be. So I'm proclaiming that from my mouth to to, to him that I know that he is, he is, you, you, uh, he is God. And um, he he showed us through the Messiah, showed us like the humility he had, even though the great power he had, right? He 
where he deferred to the father. So I, I really cherish the examples that we have in scripture about how Messiah prayed, how merciful he was to people, how he showed a uh, strong rebuke to people who needed it. It's like, if we operate the way he did and be conforming to that image, like that's, that's a beautiful thing. And you can't fake that. It's, you know, you can't fake that at all. Go ahead, bro. I always look at it as like, you know, Yeshurel, Israel, we meant to obey. And you know, they're his son, right? He says in scripture, my firstborn son, but then they didn't do the things they were meant to all the time and they got punished for it. But Yahushua is literally the perfect son. That's how I look at it, that, you know, his his example is to show us like how to be the perfect child of Yahuwah, you know, and he passed with flying colors. I mean, did better than we ever will, but he's an example of a perfect son, so. Yeah. And I think I really think that that's the, uh, the humility that, we have to have, we have to have humility in our faith is even though we're super confident, you know, I think that's part of the, the struggle, right? It's like, you know, I might post something on social media that seems so like aggressive and strong, but it's just a verse and I'll say something, but it might make somebody angry, but that's okay. But I'm not saying, Hey, I got this figured out, but I think people think you think you do. And, you know, that's a, that's also part of it. Um, so along the lines of, Holiness. I wanted to say a couple other things too on this this topic because I think we touched on James uh, and Peter, but I want to show you a little bit from what Paul wrote because a lot of people will take Paul's writings and turn them into like the 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 religion of Christianity. You know, it sounds controversial, but I just I see it. And I remember telling my brother in law Ben, you know, on a bus in Israel back in 2014, which is about 10 years ago now. I said something and he laughed, but then he, I think he got it later. I said, man, I'm so glad I'm not a Christian anymore. And he was like, whoa, like, because I think there that part of me that said that didn't realize that someone might take it the wrong way. Um, because I would say I'm still a Christ follower, but it's just I don't follow the religion of Christianity because Christianity, when you actually study the origins of Christianity, even the break off of reform, you know, all the different denominations, which I think they say there's 30,000. I've never counted them, so I can't say. Well, there's 30,000, but just it makes sense that even if there's a hundred of them, they can't all be right, right? Um, and I don't see them in the Bible. I don't see denominations in the Bible. What I do see in the Bible is that there's 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 gates. There's one people. There's one God. There's one Messiah, one faith, one immersion, you know, one people. And we were told to be one, right? And Messiah says they're in the world, right? Don't take them from the world, but but um, what do you say? Not of the world. That don't don't be of the world, right? But that your word through His word and your testimony that people will come to know the Father and His Son, Messiah. You should you should Jesus, right? That's eternal life. John seventeen three. So He put His name on on people. He's proclaimed His name throughout the generations, and so that word is still going out. And so we're just in that period of time for when Messiah uh, died resurrected and ascended and the end times right so when is it is it here 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 but we're here right is it now like we have to live like the the scriptures say set apart because we're part of his people so christianity um a lot of practices within christianity people are ignorant of it's roman pagan blending okay so when i read be set apart from the world and things of the world and i see the church is very worldly which most people can tell even in Christianity, like, yeah, we don't do LGBTQ, but I'm like, yeah, but you still do the things that Yah says not to do. So let's, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 6, um, part of it. And then um, I think I'm going to read part of Romans 13 and a couple of other Paul's epistles so that you can see that th these are all these, these concepts that we're talking about and sharing through the word, through Messiah and the Father and the Torah, they're all in the New Testament too. So 2 Corinthians 6. Uh, verse 14. Now, this is a tough one because a lot of people, I think they, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Verse 14 says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Unequally yoked. Okay, so being yoked. Okay, just the concept here. So you, many of you guys probably know this, but if it's being recorded, people will hear it. Uh, animals will be yoked and, and they'll have a yoke over their neck, okay, to pull like the, the plow. So if you're with a bull, and the sheep, he wouldn't put them two together, right? Because the bull's going to move and the sheep's neck's going to get broken. So he's using this metaphorically saying, like, 
don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers who those who people who profane the name of Yah, they just don't, you know, they don't regard him at all. Okay. Um, because you'll see also in Corinthians says, uh, bad company corrupt, corrupts good character. Um, you will be involved in a group of people who um, will have an impact on you versus you impacting them. So while the believer is not is supposed to be separated from the world and things of the world, Messiah would send his people into the world, right? So that they would be know him, know his name, know his truth, and become a believer. So you got to go to the lost, right? Because to seek and save the lost is still the mission. And that's what the Messiah's mission was. So where are the lost? They're in the world. Just where you were and maybe are two feet, you know, you gotta get you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. Like it's it's one or the other. You can't have a divided heart. So um you're you're not supposed to join them in their wickedness. Okay, that's the point. And he continues, says, For what partnership is there between the righteous and lawless? So righteousness is obeying the commandments of, of Yah. Lawlessness is disobedience to Yah's law. And that's that word there, anomia, is a um a Greek word, but it, it says it right in the description. If you look at the lexiconic importance, it says that it is a ignorance of, of, of Yah's law, um, or willfully disobeying of God's law. Um let me just make sure I got it. I don't want to lie, so um, Yeah, anomia, unrighteousness. Okay, G five forty uh, four fifty eight, a condition without law, being ignorant of it because of violating it, contempt and violation of law, iniquity, wickedness, like lawlessness, <laughs> anomia. It's right there in the descriptions. Um, and you know this is just a study tool, right? And you know all, the apostle Paul said, study to show yourselves approved, meaning to study like what all scripture. All scriptures God breathed, Second Timothy three sixteen. That means he was talking about the the scriptures. His his letters weren't scripture at that time; they weren't considered the authority. So he's referring to something called the scriptures, right? And even when um, Peter says people will take Paul's letters, well, he's saying my beloved brother Paul, Second Peter three fourteen through seventeen. He says they the the unrighteous right or the unstable and unlearned unlearned meaning not studied will twist them meaning make their meaning different to their own destruction and to lawlessness so like there's a lot of warnings in here back to second corinthians 6 what fellowship does light have with darkness light like the law the messiah and darkness void of void of yah's laws it says what harmony does the messiah have with belial it's a uh, a false god of wickedness, right? Lawless men. Or what does the believer have in common with an unbeliever? These are questions that like he's being rhetorical, right? What agreement does God's temple have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Whoa. Like, how's our temple, guys? Like, how is it? Is it does it need a, a little work? Is it need is there leaven in there? Is there there's products in there that need to be taken out? This is something that all of us should be testing, especially on a day like Shabbat, where we want healing. We want we want healing. We want restoration. It said, just as God said, and now he's going to quote. Listen to what he's going to quote. He's going to quote from Ezekiel. I will dwell with, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, Elohim, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahuwah. Touch no unclean thing, then I will take you in. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Man. Says Yahuwah Tzavah. End of chapter. Chapter 7, verse 1. It continues. Therefore, what he just said, light and darkness don't mix. Right? The temple of God and idols don't mix. Since we have these promises, loved ones, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of body and spirit, Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is missed. Fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, right? It's the beginning of wisdom. If we don't have a healthy fear, that means we're not humble 
and contrite of heart where God will come in and, and operate within our temple. Okay. God cannot reside in a temple full of idols. It's like, okay, if you want to worship temple idols, then go ahead. That's right. Psalm 139, right? Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts. Right? If there's anything wicked in me, help me turn. Right? Turn back to you and your ways of righteousness. Um, so that we're, we're missing the proper fear of, of you. We're missing it because we reject the very things that his son came to, to show us. Return to the ancient path. Remember when we were talking about the yoke? Don't yoke yourself with believers and unbelievers. Yusha says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Seek the ancient paths. We're supposed to seek the ancient path. Jeremiah chapter 6, right? Seek the ancient paths. Uh, you'll find rest for your souls. Right? Come to me. He said, come to me. Um, the problem I have with what the church preaches on that is it's easy. Come to Jesus. It's really easy, right? What Jesus are you coming to? Because they'll take his word and say, oh, look, at my, my his, it's easy, right? And, and you know what it is? It is easy. But your flesh has to die. That's why I said, pick up your cross daily, execution stake, and die to your flesh every day. That's what it says, right? So it says if you love your family, you know, you want to be a disciple of, of Yahusha. He says, if you obey what I say, you'll know the truth and the truth. Will set you free. What's the truth? You know, his his ways, his laws, his instructions are his truth. So when we obey them, there's life. And then Paul says this in a couple other short places. You can write them down. I'll read them in the book of Colossians, chapter three, which is talking about the head. Messiah is the head. It says, um, verse one. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Messiah, keep Seeking the things above, where the Messiah is sitting at the right hand of God, focusing your mind on the things above, not the things of the earth, right there. For you have died, and your life is hidden in Messiah, with Messiah, in God. When Messiah, who is your life, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. That's a promise. Like That's the thing we're looking forward to. So right now, we're being instructed to set your mind upon the things above. Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you, sexual morality. How do you define it? According to his, his law, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, that is idolatry. So people can have greedy hearts. It's idolatry. You got to test yourself on that. You want, you want, you want. You know, even James says, you want, you can't get because you pray. You pray with the wrong motivation. It says now, like verse five, verse five, uh, six, because of such things, God's wrath is coming upon the sons of disobedience. It's disobedience to what? To his instructions. If there's no law, there's no, there's no um, standard upon which we can judge what's right and wrong. There's no, there's no. What is righteousness if it's, if it's not his his commandments, his instructions? Okay? So, Ephesians, which people like to quote a lot too, but if you go to chapter five, this is probably saying the same thing. Verse 1, chapter 5 of Ephesians. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love. Love your neighbors yourself. Just as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself up as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a fragrant aroma. But sexual immorality and impurity or greed, don't even let these things be mentioned among you. As it is proper for the saints, set apart. Obscene, coarse, and stupid talk are also out of place. But it said, let there be thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Obscene and coarse talk, you guys. I repent. I did that yesterday. I was joking around in the wrong way. Shouldn't do that. I repent before you. I do. I'm sorry. I pray. Ah, forgive me. But I don't want to be a bad example to the, especially to the brothers, a lot of young brothers I know. And they look at me. I'm the old man of the group. You know, I try to be cool, like, in, like, you know, rap music and stuff like that. But, I mean, that's fine as long as it's glorifying. Yeah, but like now I, I, I joke around about stuff that's not right. It says right here, it's conviction. I repent. I repent to you guys if you're watching this. Um, instead, let there be thanksgiving. Know for certain that no immoral, 
decent or greedy person who is really an idol worshiper at heart. Greed. Guys, greed's a big one. Covetousness. It says, has any inheritance the kingdom of Messiah and God? It says, let no one, verse 6, let no one deceive you, no one, with empty words. For because of such things, God's judgment comes upon the children of disobedience. So I'm reading the New Testament. I'm reading the New Testament. I'm not reading, oh, God's judging. No, like the, the apostles, in their writings, they warned about the things. Why would they warn a people who say, I love the Lord and now I'm saved if there was no way you could fall away from your faith, right? There would be no warning. It'd be like, you're sealed for the day of redemption. A lot of people say, you're chosen, you're sealed, right? The Ruach, the Spirit sealed you. I do believe that, but if we harden our hearts, whose uh, microphone is on? Oh, there you go. I got you, militia. Wait, okay. So if you harden your hearts, like they did, the Israelites did, and we're going to talk about that next. So this is you know, this might go longer than expected, but I, if you guys have something else to do, you don't have to stay on. If you harden your hearts, like they did at Meribah, right in Exodus seventeen, like you won't enter into his rest. That's why the Sabbath day remains for Yah's people. It says in, in Hebrews three and four, um, it's a sign upon his people. Exodus thirty one thirteen, like we this day is a special day. And it's because Yah set it apart for his set apart people called by his name, you know, to worship him. How? In spirit and truth. Not just in spirit and not with and just in truth, but in spirit and truth. That's the, that's the expectation. So um, defining these things is super important. But Luke, please do speak. I've been going for a little while. I just wanted to share. So it was interesting when you mentioned, you know, because obviously a lot of people preach that once saved, only saved. Are always safe, sorry, and um, you know they think they're sealed forever. But it's like we have to remember that we're not. That's not the case because if we're walking with Yah, that's why it says walk with Yah. You know, even Psalm twenty three. Um, yeah, I walk through the valley of the shadow of Jeff, but he's still walking with Yah. It's always about walking and not being stagnant because if you don't turn back, like it says in Second Peter two, it says for if they for if, for if after they have escaped, sorry, the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of, um our master and savior, Yahushua Messiah, they are they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment de delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. And that's quoting Proverbs 26, I think, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, twenty six eleven. So, yeah, it's, it's it's important to stay walking with Yah because if we don't and we we turn away, well, First Peter four says that the righteous are scarcely saved. So we have to walk and take it serious because mm -hmm. it's not a, it's not a joke. We have to always walk with Yah because otherwise we're walking as the children of disobedience. So the walk is serious and it's continuous. Amen. That's true. James and Rosie you got your hand up. Go ahead. I'll be quick. Luke, that was a really, that's a really good example to bring up. And those are scary. Those are very scary. And I, there needs to be a healthy level of being scared and fear there because it's, it's true. It's not a game. It's very serious. Um, I wanted to go back to just mention this uh, in Ephesians where we had Ephesians five uh, right there where it says um, six, where it says, let no one deceive you. And I had always read that as let no one out here deceive me, always keeping my eyes and ears tuned to some other person. But I had an understanding that that means you, yourself, deceive yeah. yourself. To be mindful and aware of while we're in a place where we maybe don't even listen to teachers or don't watch anybody, but we're just reading the Bible. We're trying to reason and we're trying to understand life and we're trying to understand Yah and how all these things work. We can calculate and we can come up and concoct deception in our own mind. And we have to stay fully aware of that and be like really in a place of like, because self-deception, I've gone through some self-deception and, and it's scary, scary, scary place because you don't know. You wouldn't, you would never know. There's nobody to set you straight or correct it. You know, like 
like when you're looking listening to teachers or somebody point to the word of yeah you're you're building up a structure in your own mind and deceiving yourself and that's a scary scary thing yeah thanks for sharing that because it's i think that's one of the things that um uh, as you're soldiering through this minefield of you know biblical teachings and stuff you're like which like some people got some parts right and this part wrong and you know it's it's hard right but self-examination is a an evidence of humility that yah will provide grace to you right he gives grace to the humble he opposes the proud so if you're giving if you're given instruction from the word and you're learning from it and you're like "Ooh, i'm deceiving like let no man i think it says you can deceive yourself i forget what verse it is but um um let me see uh what what luke read earlier is is totally applicable it says in, in romans 12 right instructions for us right and it says that i urge you therefore brothers and sisters by the mercies of god to present your bodies living sacrifice fully and acceptable to god which is your spiritual service do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what the is the will of god and that it's good and acceptable and perfect so being transformed right by the renewing of your mind that's a daily practice that's why we should be starting every day with prayer and thanksgiving and 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 really pleading with yeah like the, the prayer of the um the apostle the apostles prayer right it's father in heaven your name is sanctified your name right? his name is important it's sanctified it's holy your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and so there's there's this humility in that and then you're asking him, thanking him for the bread, his word, his Messiah, and then forgiveness because we've fallen short. But then being merciful to other people too. Don't hold grudges, right? That's right there too. Loving your neighbor yourself is in the Lord's prayer. Um, you know, and it's <clears throat> it's a declaration of His holiness, His kingdom. But we're we're the the part the part that I think, and we'll get to it, um, of who we are as believers and what it means to be a set apart people that's going to go a little bit deeper than what we established but i think the foundation is at least in the new testament scriptures we can see a foundation of who and what we're supposed to be like and i know that there's there's other places that i and i wanted to read one more but i think brother jared had a he put his hand up literally but there's a feature on here where you put your hand up how you doing good to see you <laughs> sorry I don't okay. know how to use things. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so I just wanted to share something that I felt like uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, you know, kind of shed some light on something for me the other night. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but Yeshua is the walking, talking, Torah, correct? That's right. Okay. So when he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, when the gate is narrow, that gate is the Torah. So Yeshua is that narrow gate that we must walk into and walk in fellowship with. Uh, am I tracking? Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. So whenever we were, I was wondering why um, God, uh, Jehovah was so uh, meticulous about his directions with uh, Moses uh, whenever it came to the temple, you know, how it was to be constructed. I mean, m meticulous, uh, the ark and the design and, and everything had to be exactly right. Um, um, and then you read uh, about, um, is it Abihu and Nadab? who uh, offered strange fire. Um, it was just more, it was uh, more um, 
to me, what I, what I feel like that was saying is that God says, you, you know, you can't just worship me in any old fashion that you like, which is what I feel like what's happening in the modern day church. You know, uh, my wife and I have come out of that. Um, I've actually came out of Mormonism uh, to begin with back in 98 and then, um, uh, you know, went into the AG, you know, church from there. And then, you know, uh, there's a long story involved in, in how that whole process went, but we've, we've came to Torah about two years ago now. And so I guess the whole thing that I was, the, the, that I really wanted to share was the whole, with, with, the, you know, Yeshua is, is that gate that we had, that we walk through and walk in fellowship with and that's how i'm that's i guess that's about that's it so i appreciate you sharing brother i i uh there's nothing to be corrected there i think uh when you say i've come to torah it's you're coming to yusha you're coming to jesus right you, you really are coming to him and he said i am the gate so that's true you know you say i'm the way well what's the way the way is uh psalm 19 one is the torah is the way you know, the truth of Psalm 119, 142, your righteousness is everlasting. Your Torah is truth. And the life, I think, is in Deuteronomy 32, I think it is. Luke, you got it? It's, four, it's Deuteronomy 32, 46 to 47. So his his Torah is uh, the, the life. And it's an yes. Yeah, it's a spiritual thing, too. I think once you understand that, um, and I think the beautiful part is you you have this like thankfulness in your heart and you're like, God's showing me this truth. The Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit is alive, it's active, and it's doing the work. And you know, anyone who shares these truths with people, and you, you know, God's not show, showing you these things because he wants you to sit and do nothing with it. He wants you to shine a light to other people because there's gonna be people near you that are in darkness that need the, the true light. And the more this darkness encroaches on us, you know, in this world that we live in, and I'm not talking about watching YouTube videos with music that make you scared or whatever, or watching crazy riots happening in other countries. I mean, that, you know, that's meant to provoke certain people, I think. But at the end of the day, you know, like, we're, we're supposed to live according to his instructions. And when we do, we're not going to be afraid of what the world can do to us. He said, if you fear... Yeah, which is to obey him, right? To reverence his name. Like, he's given us life. And that life isn't to protect your life here. Like, oh, I don't want to die. I'm going to get some guns and shoot people. Like, my goodness. Like, like, hopefully, if you're storing up food, it's so that you can feed people. You know, when the apocalypse happens, right? Everyone's storing up food because they want to protect themselves, which is fine. But they're getting guns and ammo so they can kill people. I'm like, should you have guns? Like, sure. But I don't want to kill somebody who's who's hungry, who wants food, who's going to die. I want to give them the truth. Like, this is our living bread. You know, this is our food, spiritually. So when I thank God for his, his daily bread, I thank him for his word because it's, you know, what, what does it say in Deuteronomy 8, 3? And Messiah said, it's, uh, man cannot live on bread alone, but every word that proceeded from the mouth of Yahuwah. Like, that's his word, is, is our bread, like our daily bread. And Yusha says, I'm the bread of life. So we know he and, and the word are the same. You know, he's the word. So those are all great connections. And then, you know, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to know these things, but also we have to check our, that's why the whole thing about checking your, your heart actively is like, we can become prideful in what we know. And then it becomes an arrogant judgment thing. And I'm like, I'm not, sharing something to be judgmental by people who don't know it i want to share it so that they can receive it and they'll know you or they'll know him this son because like eternal life is there you know so now we're, we're soul journeying in this life we're, we're traveling right but we're we're strangers we're, we're we're not in our home we're not in our home our eternal home anyway but you can still have joy you know you, you should said if you obey the commandments, like I've obeyed my father's commandments, then you'll show you'll show that you love me. 
right? That's John 15, 9 through 10. But he says, then my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. So, you know, yeah, we're going to be scared a little bit, but like we should be joyful even in our persecution, which we're not persecuted yet, guys. <laughs> you know, we might be in slavery, you know, to the world, uh, but we're not to be, in, you know, in the world, not of it, I guess is the best way to say it. So it's a fine line. Um, but it's, you know, it's important. Uh, I want to share one other passage of scripture in the New Testament before we go. And if you guys have to go and eat and all that stuff, whatever, that's fine. <clears throat> but in First Thessalonians 4, <clears throat> I think First Peter 4 has it too. But First Thessalonians 4 is another witness to this. It says, finally, then brothers and sisters, we ask that you appeal in the Lord Yusha, just as you receive from us the way you ought to walk and please God, as in fact you are walking, that you keep progressing more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Yusha. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. To abstain, listen to sanctification, abstain from sexual morality, to know each of you how to gain control over your own body and holiness and honor not in the passions and lusts like the pagans who do not know God and not to overstep his brother and take advantage of him in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we told you before and solemnly warned you for God did not call us to impurity, but into holiness. Consequently, the one who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God who gave his Holy Spirit to you. Now, considering concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God. Direct access, you guys, to love one another. In fact, if you practice, as in fact, you even practice it towards all your brothers and sisters throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to keep progressing more and more. See, this faith is a progression. And aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands, just as we directed you, so that you may behave properly towards outsiders and have no need of anything. I got, there's so much there, but, you know, when people say, hey, you got to get out there and evangelize everybody, I'm like, not everybody's called to, to evangelize. Nope, that's a gift that the, that the Spirit gives you. Not everybody's supposed to go out there and be a shepherd teachers it's not it, it's a fearful thing right to be able to say or do these things so when you have instructions like in the new testament he's writing to this group in thessalonica right most of these churches that he wrote to these gatherings were persecuted so he's trying to encourage them to to keep going right keep going you know live a holy life set apart mind your own business right everyone's involved in everybody else's business but you know, he's saying, mind your business. Now, there, you might be called to go out and fish or evangelize. But make sure it's under the, the authority of, of the, the Holy Spirit. I'm saying a lot of, I've seen a lot of young guys, too, over the years. They, they pop up and fade away. Why? Because they, they went out in a different spirit to make videos on YouTube and stuff. And it's like, now they're nowhere to be found. Why? Well, maybe they're living the quiet life now. I don't know. But a lot of times it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll use it. But we have to have a sober estimate of ourselves. We have to know who we are. So I guess the, the main topic here is to be set apart as saints, like as the, the Kadashim, if you will, um, the set apart saints of, of Yahuwah. Like that's that was the point of Messiah coming so that we could be reconciled back to God through his blood. The atoning sacrifice, right? So our sins can be washed away. But now that that's happened for you, if it's happened to you and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, walk in his truth by the power of his grace, his Holy Spirit. And that's his law, it's his ways, it's his commandments. Um, and that glorification is, is a promise. So don't give up the promise that Yahuwah gave to, to you through his rock, through his son, because you want the temporary things of this world. You can't, you can't be both. So it's a hard message. The thing is, there's a number of people who, you know, maybe on here 
you're striving. I know a number of you. You're 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 working hard to do the will of Yah. It's like it's beautiful, right? Don't give up. Keep pressing in. You know what's true, and and keep doing the things that you know are true, and then be willing to receive correction and change if Yah shows you. It's huge. It's a big revelation, right? Like, okay, I don't know everything, but I'm learning, progressing, right? Praise Yah. Alicia, did you have something to say here? Go ahead. You can unmute. You have to unmute. I mean, uh, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, dear. Okay, I was just about to say, um, so in our personal walk with um, Yeshua, um, I think, you know, to be, to have connection with the Holy Spirit every day, which has been talked about, um, is in, really important. And to have the gift of discernment is a massive thing in the strive to becoming holy. Without discernment, it, there is no value in that. You need to have discernment from the Holy Spirit. And um, in order to do his will, to listen to what he wants you to do each day, how you can serve the Holy Spirit every day. Was there a question there? I'm sorry. Did you hear all that? I just didn't hear how you ended it. You talked about discernment, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. Yes. So, so to be checking in every day and praying about how you can serve the Lord. Yeah. Sure. And acting on His will. So when He prompts you, when the Holy Spirit prompts you, as and when that you act on it, that you don't just ignore it or walk away. And perhaps you might be tempted to engage in worldly situations when you and trends when you know you shouldn't, but you do. That, that kind of behavior is what I'm talking about. Um, going against the holiness of God. So really, it is stepping back and away to be set apart, to act on the will of the Holy Spirit. Now, that is discernment. Yes. One of the things that, while you were saying that, I recalled the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. Now, think about this. They were, they were redeemed by Yah's hand with an outstretched arm and pulled out of slavery. He did it right? They didn't do it. He demonstrated his power through the plagues and through leading them out with Moshe, Moses, just like Yusha, he leads us out, right? Now they're in the wilderness. And what Yahuwah does is he marries his people, okay? But he gives them something. He gives them a cloud by day as a covering, keep them cool in the desert heat. And he gives them the pillar of fire by night, keep them warm because it gets cold in the, in the desert, right? But the point there was that was his presence. When that cloud moved or that fire pillar moved, they moved. When it stayed, they stayed. So the discernment is if you if you know him and you have this Holy Spirit, it's going to direct, it's going to cover us, it's going to convict us, it's going to comfort us. It has all these different attributes, but it also is going to move and when we hear his voice, which is from his his laws, right, his his Torah's instruction, we hear these things. When we act upon them, that's our faith. Faith is active. Yeah. And it's always growing. We're always learning. We're always discerning. Is it Yah spirit or is it a familiar, demonic, or other spirit? This is why we have to know what is written. If we don't read this word for ourselves under this discernment, right? Because the devil is going to tell you, you don't have to do that. In the beginning, the devil says, right, to Eve, did God really say that? That's not true. A liar. He's a liar. He invented the lie. So we have to know what is written because when Yahushua, Yeshua was tempted in the wilderness, he says, it is written. 
So he had the spirit and he had the word. That's our defense. Okay. Now, because we were going to, I was going to go down this other, I didn't know how I was going to do this, but you helped. So I, I appreciate it. When I was thinking about the pillar in the cloud, when, when Yah saved his people, there's a huge event that happens in, in Exodus chapter 19. Okay. You and Mary's Yasharal or Israel, right? Marries them. Okay, this is sort of going to hopefully tie together something that maybe is a number of different teachings or whatnot. So we understand the call to holiness is a New Testament, Old Testament thing, right? Um, the wedding supper of the Lamb will happen, correct? That re the, the, the fact that we are referred to as uh, betrothed, right, married to Messiah, but we haven't consummated it yet. Because he's going to come back for a bride. He says that is what? Undefiled. Pure. That's why all these letters describe the type of people we're supposed to be. Because we're preparing to meet our groom. Okay. So what happens in Exodus 19. Is a marriage ceremony. And Luke, you brought this up. So I don't know if you want to read. Exodus 19, I think one through five or six. Well, it was just a fan to the chat. Yeah, so um, Exodus 9, <laughs> Exodus 19, one to six, yeah. So we got in the third month, when the children of Yeshua were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up to up unto Yahuwah, and Yahuwah called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you an eagles' wings, and brought you, up, brought you unto myself. Now, this part, I just wanted to add on to it. This is a very important part because there's, there's conditions that people forget about and they always forget that following Yah is conditional. Even though people talk about unconditional love, he loves us and his love is great. It's a different love. No one else, you know, has that kind of love, but there is conditions because he's holy and nothing undefiled has communion with him. So now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine. And you should be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which, th which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And it's similar to like 1 Peter 2.9. So, yeah. I don't know if you want me to continue reading part the other part of the chapter or if you want to take over. but No, keep reading. Keep reading. This is... okay. Okay. So, and Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which he who had commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahuwah have spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto Yahuwah. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak of thee, and believe of thee forever. And Moses told us the words of the people unto Yahuwah. And, and Yahuwah said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and be ready against the third day, for, you, for the third day, Yahuwah will come down in the sight of all the people unto Mount Sinai, and thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people was in the camp. Um, so that, sorry, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with Yahuwah, and they stood at the nether part of the mount and mount sinai was altogether on a smoke because yahuwah descended upon it in fire 
and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and Yahuwah answered him by a voice. And Yahuwah came down upon Mount Sinai, on top of the mount, and Yahuwah called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, Go down, charge of the people, lest they break through unto Yahuwah to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priests also which come near unto Yahuwah sanctify themselves, lest Yahuwah break forth upon them. And Moses said unto Yahuwah, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, chargest us saying, Set bounds um, about the mount and sanctify it. And Yahuwah said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up. Thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto Yahuwah, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. That's the end of the chapter. Yeah, it, it continues in the 20, which is the, the covenant. So that the covenant that, that Yah made when he did this marriage ceremony, if you will, is he says, you are going to be a holy nation, a priesthood, right? And he, and even Luke said in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says that you, you will be a people. So he's talking to the people who are outside the land, right? He's saying, remember when we said in 1 Peter, let me just go there real quick. He said, greetings and emissary of Messiah Yusha to the sojourners in the diaspora. And so he's talking to these people who are to be set apart, even though they weren't living in Israel, right? In the Israel, in the mm -hmm. land. And so he says, um, verse nine, right? After he says, you're born again. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So you belong to him. Mm -hmm. you're, you're possessed by God. Like he, he owns you. He's our, our master. You know, we're bond servants to him now. We're not to the world. So that you may proclaim the praise of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he quotes this. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Mm -hmm. You were shown no mercy, but now you have been shown mercy. Where is he quoting that from? That reminds me of, um, it's in Exodus somewhere, isn't it? You have mercy upon, no? Okay. No, it's Hosea. Oh, oh, he does have mercy <laughs> Hosea 6? Uh, no, it's Hosea oh. 1 and 2, I think. Okay, okay. Because okay. remember, okay, so this is a, the segue here is, I'm going to say something. Yeah, willing, it's absolutely what he wants me to say. Okay? Mm -hmm. The reason, one of the biggest reasons why people in the church today, Christianity, otherwise, why they don't understand what the scriptures say and how it connects to the people in the, in the Older Testament writings is because they believe that they are now replaced Yah's people, Israel. Mm -hmm. They're the church now. So what God commanded to Israel, Israel, Israel that what they command to Israel, right, his bride, who he says, are my people forever, they believe that that the lie from Satan, that, that Israel is no longer God's people, and they also believe that Oh, the people who would call themselves Jews in Israel are Israel, not understanding who Israel is. Okay. This is where it gets hard because people hear this and they don't get it, right? They don't understand it because they, they haven't been trained to read the scriptures all the way through. So if I'm reading in First Peter 2 that you are a holy priest and a nation set apart for holiness, they're like, yeah, that's us, right? Is it? Is it? Because he's now going to re reference Hosea. So... Chapter 20 of Exodus goes through the Ten Commandments, right? That's the covenant. That's the holy covenant. God says, this is my marriage contract with Israel. Now what happens is Israel, after you go through the Ten Commandments, the people, the 12 tribes there, right, broke it. They, they set up golden calves and they worshiped the golden calves as if they were worshiping Yah. Let's not forget that. They didn't think they were worshiping a false god. But he said, don't do these things. And they did it right away. So they transgress the, the marriage contract right away. Yah says, I'm going to start over with, with you, Moses, and get rid of these people. Moses does something incredible, which is the heart of, of Messiah. He says, don't blot them out. If you're going to blot them out, blot them out too. Forgive them. You know, if you're going to start over with me, get rid of me too. That's the heart of Messiah. He laid down his life for his God responded to that and said, okay, but I'm going to institute some things because I can't be near him. He wasn't even going to go with him. 
And Moses said, if you don't go with us, then what's the point? I, I just love that how Yahua, God of, God of creation, responds to his people when they're, we need you, we're desperate for him, we need you. And you see that even though Yah's people, right, have disobeyed just like we do, right? We've done over and over again. He has mercy upon his people. So replacement theology is, is a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous doctrine of devils, okay? It calls God a liar because Jeremiah 31 clearly says that if these laws pass from my sight, then Israel will stop being a nation for me. Well, his laws, which the heaven, the, the earth, moon, and stars, they have not passed from his sight, okay? This is, this is like one of the most dangerous things. So I learned this a long time ago, but I think it's good to revisit it using the scriptures to do it, obviously. But People who are like, hey, we're supposed to keep the feast days, right? Leviticus 23, it says, when Yahuwah spoke to Moses, then Yahuwah spoke to Moses saying, the children of Israel tell them, they are, these are the appointed times of Moedim of Yahuwah, which are to proclaim to be a holy convocation, my appointed days. Work is to be done on six days, but the seventh day is Sabbath, the solemn rest, holy convocation, you are not to do any work. This is the Sabbath to Yahuwah and all your dwellings. Okay. Then you read the feast days, you're like, well, that was for Israel. That wasn't for us. Well, if you're not Israel, because Yahushua Yehu, came in his father's name. He said, I come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. People who were not Israelites, like the Canaanite woman who said, my daughter needs to be healed. Matthew 15. He says, I'm not going to give to the dogs what belongs to the children. And she says, yeah, yes, but even the dogs get the scraps that fall from the master's table. She didn't proclaim. She didn't get upset. She's like, she showed faith. He said, because of that faith, she's well. He responds to that, not to, oh, we're the people, like, it's crazy. So, uh, one second, Luke, because if we're not grafted in to Israel, the commonwealth of Israel, the olive tree, according to Romans 11, if we're not part of his covenant promises through Ephesians 2, right? The commonwealth of Israel. You've been brought near by the blood of Messiah to the commonwealth of Israel. What is that? The people of Yah, Israel. The Israel of God. There's 12 tribes in the end, right? In the There's 12, 144,000 from each of the 12 tribes in Revelation 7 and Revelation 21. So there's 12 gates. And he said to the disciples, you will sit on the 12 thrones judging the tribes. So, Yeshua didn't say there's not going to be tribes in the end or Israel's not going to be saved in the end. It's a hard message, but it's what the Bible says, and you can test this. And when I see our Messiah, I see his disciples quoting books like Hosea, it's good to pay attention to what the prophet Hosea says, because he says the prophets, right? They warned of these things. So um, I want to just put that as a foundation for what we're going to probably talk about next here. But Luke, you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, you, you pretty much said what I was going to say, to be honest, but it's like, yeah, like if you don't have the the true faith, is, it's not just, you know, a prayer and then we're done. Because like, I don't know how the churches are in America, but at least here in England, you know, they get you to say a prayer and it's like, okay, you're saved. It's like, you know, you, you, you know, they teach abstaining from fornication, but it's like, what about the faith and the promises made to his actual people and being grafted in? So it's, it's really important. If you have faith in his promises, and you ha actually have to believe the true promises, you know, and his people aren't aren't a joke you know it's, it's the people he chose to be an example but he's calling them back and with that he's calling them, you know Jim has to be grafted in and become his people too and be in the covenant so it's always about being in covenant with you you know marriage is people everything has a covenant and having faith in, in his covenants and his promises is very important amen yeah i'm glad you shared because like we're married we're married like it's like if you know the scripture of the new testament we're we are now awaiting the groom to come even in the parables that Messiah gave us in Matthew 20, 24, the end days 25, there's going to be bridesmaids or virgins, right? Ten of them, only five, right? Had the oil, the other five didn't, but they were they were all waiting for their, their husband to come. So he's showing you like the wedding, the wedding feast of the lamb, the, the wedding, the wedding feast. There's a banquet that's going to happen. And he's like, he's going to find out who are his, the wheat or the tares, the wheat or the fruitful ones, the tares are the ones that reject. They're, they're firm, right? They won't bow down and they won't bear fruit for his kingdom. So, you know, we talk about Israel, Israel, like there's a lot of versions of it out there. So we got to be 
mindful of that, you know, a lot of people have been teaching this, like Jim Staley taught this to me through his identity crisis teaching. I thought he did a great job because I'd never heard of it before. Right. And that got huge, like people, a lot of people watch that. And a lot of people were waking up at that time. When I say waking up, they're like, oh, we're yas people like, oh my goodness. Right. Then you have to stay humble because you can be prideful. Like, oh, I'm Israel now. You know, like you see people on the street corners, like you guys are going to lick my boots and stuff. Like, no, 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 that's not, <laughs> that's not the the way. That's not how you, Messiah, that's not how, how we walk. Um, but there's going to be people who are going to come to this realization that we're Israel. Like, okay, am I a natural born branch? Probably not. I don't know. But it, to me, it, it doesn't matter because all who join Israel are going to be saved. Just like when they left Egypt, right? There were sojourners among them, a mixed multitude. They were all Hebrews. They were all part of the Yaz people. You know, the distinction was was not, it was based on the condition of their heart, right? But they heard it and they saw what God did and they followed him. So it's not, it's it's for all people, right? You, you usually came, he said, to save the lost. He says, it says uh, in John 3, 16, it says, Yah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's for the whole world, guys, but not the worldly, but the world, the people in the world. That's us. We've, we've come to this place and we're like, well, now we see. So now what are we supposed to do? Be set apart, be holy. And we're going to keep talking about that, but go ahead, Luke. I just wanted to say, so it's interesting you mentioned Exodus, because in Exodus 12, we see in like the latter part about the Passover that the sons of the stranger, they had to be circumcised to keep the Passover with them. And, you know, they were sojourning among them. But so that means they had to keep a custom with the, the Hebrews, you know, but then what do we see with the church? If they, you know, don't abide in the same unbelief that, you know, the, the Northern Kingdom abided in, then they can be grafted in because they're going to be having a circumcised heart coming together with a pure heart. And then they're going to be, you know, cleansed, sanctified in his word. So, yeah, it's always about keeping the customs that Yah's put out and that's his Torah. So, yeah. Um, so, um, I like to, I always was one of those people and I do this for a living. I'll say I, I have to find evidence for things that happen. And so when I apply the Bible and the scriptures to, to say, well, where does it say that? That should, should be what we all do. Um, testing all things, holding what's good. Um, test everything, right? And be a Berean, like whatever the, the preacher or whatever teacher is saying, you should take to the scriptures to see if what they're saying is true, just like they did in Acts 17. Yes, Brother Jared, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Oh, hey, uh, so I figured out how to use the, the hand. <laughs> um just going off of what you were just talking about about the uh uh the uh being grafted in mm -hmm. um I'm, forgive me i i'm a truck driver so i listen to the bible a lot and sometimes i don't catch where certain things are but it, it was literally just saying that or um uh father was uh saying i want to say it was ezekiel but anyways the soldier was to be allotted an inheritance as long as you know the soul the it didn't matter who they are it was just called they're a soldier so they're not uh israelites by blood they're the grafted in they're the they're the well, literally the sojourner, and they are uh, to be given an inheritance of land right along with them, as long as they, you know, were following all the uh, the laws and you know the Torah. Maybe you know where the, exactly where that's at. I just, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Well, what's interesting is your timing of when you share things is very interesting, and I trust that it's Yah's way to make this work. Like Leviticus 19 is what we were sharing earlier, right? Yeah. Leviticus 19, 33 and 34 says, if an outsider dwells with you in your land, you shall do him no wrong. The outs the says the outsider dwells among you shall be to you as a native born among you. You shall love him as yourself. And for your dwelled as an uh, for you dwelled as an outsider in the land of Egypt, I am you who are your God. So he's saying, like, you were a stranger at one time, right? So you better treat them like you would want to be treated. And listen, the Messiah says in Matthew chapter 7, 
he sums up the law and the prophets, right? Matthew 7, 12, okay? So in all things, do to others what you would want them to do unto you. For this is the Torah and the prophets. This sums it up, right? So Yeshua is referring to the Torah, and he's saying, you, you want to uh, follow the Torah? You want to do the Torah? Treat other people the way you want to be treated, right? Yah is merciful, so we shall be merciful. And so if we were all to follow that simple instruction, people say it's the golden rule, I don't disagree, then we would have world peace, we'd have people helping each other, and we wouldn't making we wouldn't be making distinctions amongst each other from a denominational perspective and, and whatnot. So that's I think that's what he means. Now there's other places within the scriptures, I think in Numbers 14, maybe not 14, 15. It says that uh, the foreigner and the stranger among you are to have the same law, right? And I've always thought of it, I think people always say that, that it's, um, they have to do the same laws as us, Israel, right? Or like, now that I'm in, I got to do these. It's like, no, we get to. That's my attitude anyway. We get we get, we get, get to participate in the very blessings that, that Yah's given us. And any part of me that doesn't want to obey Yah is my flesh. And my flesh can never do anything good. They can't obey God's law. It's not possible for it, according to Romans 8, 7. It's, it's carnal-minded, right? And so that's the other thing. Again, Romans 12, renew your mind daily. And when we don't do that, we're not going we're, we're gonna to be cloud-minded. We're going to start living in delusions. And we're not going to be doing what uh, the sister said earlier, is to discern. Discern the spirits. Because like we're spiritual people. There's many spirits, right? How many people are posting stuff? What's the spirit behind it? Especially if it doesn't align with, with God's word. It's it's not something we should be following. Um, I hope that, that was helpful, Jared. I, I appreciate what you do though, too, because I have other brothers that that drive trucks and man, it's that's a pretty important task that you do. And the fact that you're using it to you know, probably bring whatever you you drive to people is a blessing, um, but you're also using it in a way to 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 hear what the Father's telling you. And by playing Scripture, I mean that's it's a good example for all of us if we're going to drive somewhere and we have the ability to put Scripture in our car to listen to it instead of the Prince of the Power of the Air, whatever demonic music that's out there that we listen to. But just wanted to share that with like you in appreciation. Is my mic my mic still on? Correct. Yes. Yes, sir. I was going to say I just looked up numbers for you. It is numbers fifteen. Uh, numbers fifteen fifteen. As for the assembly, there shall be one statutes for you and for the sojourner who sojourns with you, a perpetual statute throughout your generations. As you are, so shall the sojourner be before Yahweh. So yeah, that's uh, that. Uh, 15 starting at verse 14 and going through 31 it's uh, titled the law of the soldier mm. so yeah 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 that, that that's right and 15 is uh got a lot of meat in there too the whole bible is full of what i call meaty it's it's something we're supposed to digest right the word um i want to respect people's time because i know that um there might be other congregations. I think our brothers in Illinois are probably started now too. I feel like I don't want to take anybody away from that. Um, but my prayer is it's been profitable time. I think if if you guys are up for it, we can probably do, but I think if we use this as a foundation today and we've sort of set the table for what um, it means to be Israel, I do think that the scriptures, and I don't want to do disservice, so I think I'd like to take more time as well personally because I was really fired up about going through Jeremiah 3. So if you want to take notes and maybe prepare for like next week, um, I think I'm in town next week, but if you want to prepare for like next week, I would go through Jeremiah 3, maybe each two, 3 and 4. I would take a look at 1 Kings 11, 12. And then, you know, the book of Hosea is like 14 chapters, I think. So if you wanted to read the book of Hosea, I would do that. Um. Second Kings chapter 17. Because I think there's um there's a lot of references to these scriptures that I think will help understand 
Beautiful. I even, Go ahead. I even think Genesis 12, um, Genesis 12, 18 and 22, they fit in because his promise to Abraham is referenced in Galatians. So um, Good you guys could, could, could note that down too. Yeah, so Luke and it, maybe we'll we'll chat later. I know you've got a space today on Twitter, so if you guys are wanting to hear some more, it's about we try to do these. We've been, I think, uh, we've all been part of congregations or fellowships where it's it gets kind of weird, you know. There's like this authority structure, and I do believe that God's order for sure. Um, and I liked when I was reading like what James says, brothers and sisters. When Paul says, "My brothers and sisters," because we are we're family. You know, I'm not here trying to gain people to follow my congregation or my, I, I'm Nick, your brother. I, I have no title. I don't want one. And we need to um, sharpen iron together. If you're like, hey, we're learning this stuff. I've never heard this. Good. Like, receive it. If it doesn't align with what we're saying, then, you know, feel free to share, ask questions. I like that people ask questions, even if they're uncomfortable. Um, don't worry about that. Uh, First Kings 11 and 12, Second Kings 17. Who are the two uh, sisters? So, um, but yeah, we've been involved in in other groups and it's in other congregations, and it's hard to find fellowship because, you know, sometimes they make you feel like you got to join. Um, sometimes the leadership gets weird, and I get that. Um, and a lot of times people just don't know where they're supposed to go. So, my hope and prayer is that this will be. Um, there's no name to it; it's just fellowship. But it's to get uh, brothers and sisters together to be hearing the word of God you know, be encouraged and then, you know, studying the scriptures and then doing what, what y'all want you to do. And, you know, to help each other, you know, we're most of you guys on here, I think we have our phone numbers and stuff. So, you know, if you need help, practical help, spiritual questions, I might have them too. Um, so let's, you know, that's my, my heart for this, this group here that, um, you know, a lot of people have been abused by pastors and stuff and, rabbis all that stuff watchmen proclaim apostles stuff like that like i want you guys people to be healed and be strengthened and encouraged in the days that we're in i mean that's it you know this the doctrines are good you know it's good to know doc have good sound doctrine you never go wrong staying in what the messiah taught and the apostles taught like and if you understand that they accord with what the word the torah says then you'll you'll have what you need to be equipped you know anyway that's what i want to share and so, James, Rosie, go ahead and maybe we'll pray and have next week. Oh, I just wanted to say that if you ever do like a nighttime or an evening gathering, like we would really be interested in that. So because we have a lot of wildness going on during the day. So, yeah, um, yeah just throwing it out there. If you ever want to do like an evening or a nighttime, we'd be into that. So that's all. That's a suggestion yeah. if anyone else wants to do a nighttime or evening gathering. So. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. It's like it's hard to, it's hard to have uh, the timing, you know, for everybody to work out. And I get that. And uh, the other thing is, I I do think if we record these, we can post them. So if you can watch at the end, but it might not have the same interaction, which I think is good. But if we could, um, you know, commit, we can always commit to like sharing information and then the ability to fellowship at you know individual times if it works. But anyway, so. Hi, Lily. Hey, Don. Hey, Michael. It's Michael. Good to see you guys. I haven't seen you yet. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. If anybody wants to do evening things like that, yeah, for sure. We'll we'll let you know. I'll, I'll try to keep you posted on email. And I think you guys did text me, James. If I'm not mistaken. Sorry, Lily. Did you want to say something? Uh, no, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> oh, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> we're like, it's muted. Oh. <laughs> and we're like, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Yeah, great job. I hope you guys are having a great day. It's a restful day. I do I do have some covetousness in me. I'll tell you what it is. I covet my Shabbat nap. I need to take that nap because mm. I love that 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 middle of the day, just like I can totally sleep and have that rest so we need it we need that day right it's we need almost it. not 30. Yeah. yeah what time is it oh yeah not, it's only not 30. 30. gotta get some rest but also as you hear my voice is getting hoarse because i don't have the stamina to speak for 10 hours in a row or five hours i can't do it. that's why i'm like luke jump in please help me out brother 
<laughs> so, all right, I'll really pray and then, uh, we'll, we'll end the Zoom and um, we'll see how long it takes to download, but I'll, I'll probably post it on YouTube. So um, thank you guys for, for joining and contributing and appreciate your uh, your love and your support and your prayers. We need it for each other in this time. So <clears throat> thank you all. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. All right. So, dear Heavenly Father, who we thank you for this day. We thank you for the set apart time that you've given us. Uh, we pray that you're pleased with this time and that you're honored, um, that your presence is with us always, Father God. We just need you. And we just trust that your word will not return void. So, this word that goes out, Father, that if there's anyone who's questioning what's going on in their faith or they're a little bit afraid, Father, you bring comfort to them. Help them see the, the true love you have for their soul and that they'll surrender and give themselves back to you. Um, Father, we, we ask that you help us do this on a daily basis and you give us the wisdom that we so need uh, to operate within these days that we live, um, that we don't live fearful, but prayerful, and that we live this holy set apart life that you've uh, called us to. Um, so help us to be holy, Father. We need, we need you, we need your spirit, and we need you in every aspect of our life. Help our family, please, Father, help our, our brothers and sisters who are struggling with health issues, Father, heal them in the mighty name of Yahushua. Please, God, help them uh, grow and, and trust you. And if they pass from, from this life, Father, that they're in your loving care. We can only uh, look to that hope of that blessed time where we'll be with you in the resurrection. So thank you again for your, your word, for your, your son. And we thank you for all things. In the mighty name of Yahushua, your son, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Hallelujah. Amen.